at night. I've just been catching up at night, you know, on the YouTube. No, what I mean. He's here. I was kidding. Oh. We're asking for transparency. We don't <laughs> complain because we're Stoics, Jersey. Uh, yeah. So I, I still uh, have my complaint. I, I heard you. I made a mistake, I guess. You heard us? First? Hmm? 25th to the 31st? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, the first. It, said okay. first, it said the first at 1 p.m. What do you mean the 30? Yeah, it's it's the 31st. The class goes from Monday the 5th to Sunday the 31st. Yes, right. But I made a yeah. mistake. But the yeah. email says June 1st at 1 p.m. Okay. Yes, he's so, saying he made a mistake. Yeah. That's not possible. Enough, enough the talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible, right? <laughs> So you know, you have to celebrate that you're still our human. It's interpretation that's wrong. That's if you, all. <laughs> if you make mistakes, it's still human. Yes. I'm kidding. So will there be an end of the cage six? What is it? Will there be an end to the cage six? Yeah, it will be. It will be the food. Uh, oh, sweet. And it will be probably, probably the last one. Okay. Uh, Good thing I never misinterpret anything. <laughs> okay. Say more about the last one, Jersey. I know. I just got that food book now. It took several weeks for it to come. I don't know why. What did you get? I got the the other one. You know, the the food one, the Master Fatalist about the food. Yeah. Okay. It took a long time. For some reason, reasons today, everything is slow, right? But yeah. Why? So. Um, I'm happy it's still coming. Everything's still coming. So. It's good. Yeah, I have I have clients that uh, they are somewhere in Arizona, rented a house and staying there for months, and and they have problems with weights because weights are sold out. So on Amazon. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. It it takes time. So no reason for whining, right? You just wait mm -hmm. patiently, and it will come. Meantime, you do something else. Exactly. That's it. That's all. So I saw the movie Rush. Oh. All right. So anybody wants to say something about it? I love the movie, but I actually wanted your take on it because I view it as two very successful people with very different virtue systems. Yeah, well, well, I don't see the movie really meaningful because the movie is only about the two successful people who uh, tries to uh, have glory in life. So there is no virtue in either one. So it's just only what is there is the pursuit of glory. But pursuit of glory is not uh, worthy of poetry or arts. You know, it's, there's no... Uh, there's no use <clears throat> of that to the unfortunate human being. I think that the, the most interesting character in the movie, the beautiful character, was one. Who was that? I really like Nikki Lauda. I mean, but... Well, he was an entertaining character, very cold in a way, and... Uh, Pursuing his way, scared of being happy and have fun, uh, so very um, robotic mm. and not fun around, really. That's what he was. The other one was uh, fun around, but also, uh, how I would say... Uh, self-destructive? Not only self-destructive, but... Uh, also um, creating this entertainment around as a as a as a means of life it's just not really uh, a, a good character either but there is one character a beautiful character in the movie who was that I want your opinion I suggested it hmm who was that? Who was that character? 
Okay. Margaret is the only one who knows this movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, then, we didn't watch it. It was Margaret's movie. Then you, yeah. watch the, then you will watch the movie. Okay. A very kind of interesting, uh, entertaining movie, like the other one, Shashank Redemption, right? Kind of the same thing. So it's a, uh, it's movies about um, achieving, it's like uh, the movie Pursue of Happiness, right? That movie, the kind of the movie is that he's pursuing wealth to help his family, son, right? And then in a way, uh, makes the whole thing a little bit acceptable, I, I would say. But the movie shouldn't be The Pursuit of Happiness, it should be titled The Pursuit of Wealth. Because uh, truly, you know, happiness comes from virtues and not come that you can actually catch it because you are, you are rich. The message uh, from the title and the movie was you get rich, you get happy. Well, that's a really bad message. So who did you think was the um, virtuous character in Rush? That was a... Uh, uh, on. I think I know who you think it. Uh, uh, I was just checking, was it Jersey? Was it uh, Marlene Lauda, the wife of Mickey, uh, of Mickey Lauda? Yes, yeah, that was a wife. A very beautiful oh, character, a very beautiful, uh, you know, character. A very loving and and calm and and, and giving. It was a, I was a virtuous character. And she was okay with any kind of uh, uh, outcome. She loved uh, him and she would simply um, do anything what he was after, right? And it was very clear in the hospital when she was, he was struggling to put his helmet on, how she reacted to that, right? In a loving way, you know, she was able to, to be okay with uh, his um, extremes, right? That was, the, that was the scene that, and that was the him. scene that I remember as well. Also, you know, the, the she appeared to him during the race, right? That was the message to him to stop the race. Did you see that? Do you remember that? Yeah, I do know. Yeah, so he was racing and it was raining and he saw her face. So the message in the movie was that he understood he was not uh, anymore, you know, to be scared of happiness because he said about happiness something that, um, don't remember the, uh, the happiness, that, that he's scared of happiness or he hates happiness. And, and she said, you already failed because it's already happened, right? Right. He was afraid of losing his racing edge if he was too happy. Yes. And so. she taught him that, right. Right. And then when, when he was racing, the last race in the rain, and he would probably win that title, but he saw her hair during the race in his mind. And he got it. He got it that, that, that happiness is more important than winning the race. And that was probably the only message that uh, virtue, would, virtue would happen in the movie. But very uh, uh, intense movie. Entertaining. <laughs> Entertaining movie. But they finished yesterday the movie, the, um, the Great Debaters. Wow, that was the movie. Wow, that was the movie. The end of this movie, the winning with Harvard, and we are talking about 1937, I think. So the uh, the the team from very little college goes to Harvard, and they are black, 
and they win debate there. That is just unthinkable, right? And that is what the uh, abnormal happens, right? The normal was a certain way. But the debate and the, the last speech that was delivered by a 14 year old uh, boy, wow, that is the speech. That's, that speech is worthy of watching over and over that. The two speeches actually, the boy from Harvard, when um, he claims that no matter what, uh, you cannot justify breaking law and no matter what, right? The law is the goodness and cannot, uh, you cannot break it because you are uh, breaking through um, nonviolence or you're breaking with uh, some other ways. And, and then there is a speech that delivered by the boy. Uh, wow. That speech, you guys, you need to go watch the movie and, and hear that speech. All right, we are going now into the, anyone that wants to say something, we cleared the idea of uh, that they made a mistake, right? And yeah, I'm okay with that, right? And I will correct that, of course. Uh, essential strength. Anybody wants to say something or we are ready to choose? Uh, Jersey, I want to make sure I, I have the right books in my possession or uh, on order for next week. Uh, what books do you anticipate we'll need? Next week we don't need. We need okay. them to have your body. Perfect. Thank you. The micro progression, so no books. Good. Thank you. And uh, um, all right. Somebody said you couldn't find the uh, reviews that I was talking about. Somebody wrote that you can take this book. This no, book. I, I I found it. I found him. It was me. Yeah. So it takes uh, think about this book, right? Yeah, I did. That that I should did. be should be only one fourth of the content in that book. Yeah, uh, so, uh, how would you do that actually, right? Because they are dialogues and you would need to be really extremely smart to deliver what is in this book and actually deliver what that book is delivering. That would be incredible. I would like to see that one. I would like to see that person who can deliver actually what's in this book to deliver with one fourth of writing. So I don't it, understand it, what you're saying. It, it is, uh, it's the same as you would have, a, you would take a poem uh, that is, has 20 lines. You take two lines the first, two in the middle, and two the last, and that's it. Or you take Mozart and cut a little bit pieces from you know, the beginning, from middle, and you just take 25%, that's it. Why are you saying this about 25%? Somebody reviewed 25%? No, somebody reviewed the book. It says the content, the value of the content is only one four. Oh, that's so stupid. Come on. So why, that, why that, you... that book should be uh, like written in the one fourth of the words. Wow. That's incredible, right? Must be a genius. You need to... Look at the perspective. Hmm? I think you need to look at the perspective of whoever's reading it, Jersey. Um, if they haven't had much experience um, with the main book, The Happy Body and the Program, and they're not enacting on it, then I think they would find it very difficult to absorb. I, um, it, it's only after a couple of years that using these books, I find them incredibly helpful now. But um, if, for instance... I looked at the book and I thought, oh, I need to find out about rest. And I didn't know anything else about the happy body. Then I probably would find that a very difficult book to read. And I think it's, you know, reviews are usually a comment on the reader rather than the book. But you can see how, uh, how really hard uh, is to deliver something. And because we think that we think through the 
information and we don't think through the feelings and uh, what what the dialogues are delivering right so once we and the, the whole society is more on the understanding things and doesn't go beyond that so the arts are simply removed from the society as a kind of like a uh, like books were, what is it, uh, the movie 2049 or something uh, about the fireman? Uh, in no, like what is that? 491 or something that uh, that is about the fireman that they used to burn all the books, whatever the books they find, and they are really like policemen and chasing uh, uh, any, any person that uh, could have books and when they find the person they burn all the books and take the person and then uh, change the, the the mind or just just kill the person is that fahrenheit 500 oh yeah five 500 fahrenheit fahrenheit 500 i think 451 451 okay it's, uh, 451 right ray bradbury i think yeah, Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> I was right, forty-nine. I'm it up. So it's a kind of a uh, the the idea to remove really feelings from people, so they don't feel. Because if you don't feel, then you uh, only direct it through life as message, information. But if you don't have any feelings, that could tell you that something is not right. Simply. If you don't have those feelings, then uh, you don't question anything. You are pretty much obedient and nothing is wrong, even though it's wrong. So that's why the, uh, uh, the arts are really important in life. You know, to have uh, music, to have uh, painters around, to have poets, because that is when we get into those feelings. And that's why we are reading this stuff. Because uh, all these dialogues and, and poems, stories are written to, uh, to face the happy body and able to actually uh, work on it, embrace it and make it happen in your life. Because uh, the happy body is goodness, but the fatalist doesn't want the goodness. You know, and the fatalist is strong then inside you, you have to build up that person that can reach for the happy body and sustain in your life. And without the building the master that is stronger than fatalist, then nobody is going to succeed because the happy body is a hard choice, it's goodness. And fatalist doesn't want the goodness in life. That's why we do what we do and how we do. And uh, if somebody there that can deliver this faster, <laughs> I would like to see that. <laughs> that, would, I, that would be actually amazing. <laughs> All right, we need uh, three people. Essential strength. We need a narrator, fatalist, and the master. So the, the three scenarios, five scenarios here, represent the energy of, uh, of the person that is, uh, when the energy is fatalistic, is the fatalist is strong, nobody is there. But if the fatalist is 25%, 75% and the master is 25, that's the disbeliever that, that disbeliever happens on the side of the, the fatalist. And the debater, of course, they are 50-50 and the hesitator is the one that the master hesitates. So it's not really uh, complete, but hesitates. But it doesn't mean that it fails, it's still strong, 75%. 
I'll read one portion. I'll, I'll be one of the readers. I can be the narrator. I can be the fatalist. This is Margaret. I've been in, in uh, direct confrontation with my fatalist all week, so let it continue. All right. Okay, so I'll be the master then. Okay. Uh, let's start. The fatalist. Wait, oh, everybody, don't forget you've got to close your eyes and you've got to pause at the end oh. and wait for Jersey to cue the next one and right. all of that so we don't go through it too fast. So close your eyes and then we'll start with the fatalist narrator. Essential strength, scenario three. Jen's orthopedist tells her that her strength is at the level of a basic physical activity like carrying groceries or lifting her child. Since she performs these every day, surgery on her elbows will not work. He suggests she do something to increase her strength. What kind of surgeon is he? A surgeon of prevention? I didn't even know they existed. Time to find another surgeon. Essential strength. Hold on, not yet, not yet. I will tell you when to begin. We need to pause between. All right. Okay. Essential strength, scenario three. Jen's orthopedist tells her that her strength is at the level of a basic physical activity, like carrying groceries or lifting her child. Since she performs these every day, surgery on her elbows will not work. He suggests she do something to increase her strength. What kind of surgeon is he? A surgeon of prevention? I didn't even know they existed. Time to find another surgeon. Maybe he cares about you. And what he means is that even if you have surgery, it won't help. Don't we live in the 21st century? Things like that should be fixed instantly. I think he means that your body is too weak for surgery to make it better. That's why he suggests you get stronger. I have energy. What I don't have is a healthy, what I don't have is healthy elbows and I'm determined to get help. Okay. Essential strength, scenario three. Jen's orthopedist tells her that her strength is at the level of basic physical activity, like carrying groceries or lifting her child. Since she performs these every day, surgery on her elbows will not work. He suggests she do something to increase her strength. What kind of surgeon is he? A surgeon of prevention? I don't even know, I didn't even know they existed. Time to find another surgeon. And what? Another surgery if the pain doesn't stop? Why not? I have insurance. I pay, he fixes. I think you don't get it. He simply meant that you are like a boat that can move with maximum speed of 20 miles per hour. If the boat goes upstream at that speed, but the stream moves against it at 15 miles per hour, the boat can only go five miles per hour while using its maximum speed. This can easily break the boat. Now you talk like a physicist. Well, compare the boat to your body. A bag of groceries is enough to tear your tendons and cause so much pain that you wake up at night. Okay, I get it. Shouldn't medicine have a way to make my tendons stronger? It does, although a body is only as strong as the weakest link. So if your elbows got stronger, then your wrists or your shoulders would give in. There would be no end to the surgeries. Terrible, how can this be fixed? It's very simple. You need to find a strength coach and begin the journey. I didn't see it coming. For you, everything is fixable by getting stronger. Isn't that a little crazy? Maybe. But I don't have any other solution than lifting more weight. Isn't that dangerous? It can be, but I will find an accomplished weightlifter who will know how to help me gain strength in a healthy way. 
a weightlifter, are you sure? I can get crippled even faster. Think about it this way. Who would teach you to drive more safely? A Formula One driver or a street driver? Nikki Lauda. Okay, you got me. <laughs> so let's find a great weightlifter. It can be interesting. Okay. Essential strength, scenario three. Jen's orthopedist tells her that her strength is at the level of basic physical activity, like carrying groceries or lifting her child. Since she performs these every day, surgery on her elbows will not work. He suggests she do something to increase her strength. That's horrifying. I noticed I was getting weaker, but this is worse than I could imagine. Time to do something about it. Why not find a different surgeon? There must be somebody who would do it. They mean money, don't they? I know this doctor for a long time. I feel he simply cares about me. I will call him tomorrow and ask him for his recommendation. Okay. Essential strength, scenario three. Jen's orthopedist tells her that her strength is at the level of basic physical activity, like carrying groceries or lifting her child. Since she performs these every day, surgery on her elbows will not work. He suggests she do something to increase her strength. I messed up, but the solution is simple. It's time to find a great weightlifter who will help me to rebuild my strength. Okay, open your eyes. Wow. This, this is really a good dialogue. All right, who wants to say something? You know, Jersey, a couple of years ago, um, just before I found the happy body, I had broken my foot in an, an accident where I was running for a, um, for a train and um, I had plenty of time. I saw the train ahead of me and it was coming, it was, a new, it was a different train coming early and I rushed to get it and I wasn't wearing shoes that were proper and I um, fell and broke my foot. And I didn't even know I had broken it and it wasn't until a colleague of mine, I got on the train, went to work, limped all the way to work, couldn't even walk, I mean really couldn't walk. And I got to work and a colleague said, I said, I just need to go home. And she's like, no, no, you need to get it x-rayed. And I got to a doctor and the first thing they told me after the x-ray was you need surgery. Right. And they were going to, and I didn't think I wanted surgery. And I went home, they had to wait for a week to get the swelling down. And then when I went back to the doctor, I was meeting with the, not the doctor any longer. This is like the first thing they did. And he was very disappointed when I said to him that I had done some research over the weekend and had a chance to think about it and talk to people and said, I really want to try and let it heal on its own. And I want someone that'll help me work with me on that. Um, and so the doctor came back and she said, I'll be willing, I would be willing to work with you on it, but you have to be prepared that at the end of six weeks, if I tell you it hasn't healed, that you're like going to be starting over again with, surgery and then another six weeks. Um, and I felt really strongly that I didn't want anything like a pin in my, you know, they were gonna put the screws in and, um, and they told me that it was in a terrible place. 
that there was no blood circulation and where I had broken the foot. And I, I wore that boot for 12 weeks and I did everything to strengthen it, you know, on my own and worked really hard to, to do it. And I, several years later, it's fully recovered. Um, and I never had to put that pin in. And I felt like I was fighting internally more than anything. You know, every time I thought I'm doing the wrong thing, I'm doing the wrong, you know, because everything was against that, you know, it, all the medicine and all the science wanted me to have the surgery. But I instinctively felt like it was the wrong thing to do for, for me. And I'm really glad I never did it. I, you know, I'm really glad that I found the doctor that would stay with me on it and work with me on what I wanted, I, I wanted as an outcome. Well, as soon as you put the, good for you, as soon as you put the pins, they will limit your movements. Yeah. That can set up inflammatory system and pains and so on, right? So uh, we should do everything in our powers not to do that. And then if you have to, that's fine, yeah? That, that we can do that after. We can always do that. Well, it's the same with scoliosis and kids when they grow up and the spine starts moving mm. off the center. You know, there are you know, ways to deal with these things without pins. Once you put the pins in, it's a, it's a really a rough, tough business. Like it, uh, the pins uh, hold the vertebrae in the place and try to correct the, the, the spine. So, you know, if you can do you, you do everything in order to avoid that. You know, I, I, I had this client from San Francisco came and he had the labrum tear about one inch and a half and really in pain shoulder. And uh, he was telling me uh, that he needs the surgery and it will be six weeks. And, and I was listening. I was okay with that actually, um, what he was telling me. And then uh, I said, so uh, what's going to be otoscopic and so on? Oh, no, no. He said, they will just cut my bicep tendon, open everything, cut another one. I said, what? <laughs> I said, stop, stop, stop here. <laughs> and, and then he said, it's just like, what? <laughs> right? Like uh, completely like cutting everything, putting back together. Well, what, what's going on? Where are we? Right? It's like, I said, no, no, no. You know, uh, Let's do three months and we'll see where we arrive in three months. So that happened uh, about two, three years ago. And we built that shoulder like never before. That shoulder, powerful, strong, and you know, no surgery, nothing. So a lot can be done, but you, you, you need to really try first, right? Instead of really uh, going uh, under the knife. Well, the the thing is that we don't have a culture of uh, thinking for yourself. So um, here is that uh, lesson in this dialogue that you really need to think for yourself and uh, do certain things that uh, would contribute to the better tomorrow. But if you can do avoid the knife that you avoid it, so the um, the situation with the you know with the surgeries are that when we go to orthopedic surgeon, then of course he will say that the surgery is needed because it, it, when you come to me, I will tell you that you need to exercise and, and eat better, right? <laughs> These are my tools. And when you, when you go to uh, a psychiatrist, you will get pills, right? So this is because his tools are pills. You know, he started for 10 years or 15 years to know which pill you need. That's it. That's all his 15 years of study to decide how much the pill, which one, and develop microprogression with that pill. And that is, is, of course, complex because we are dealing with, uh, you know, human emotions and feelings and so on. But we have just, you know, pills and we try to, uh, to do it the right way, of course, right? But it's, it, it's a pill. It's a bullet in the body system. And, you know, we, 
And when you go to a psychiatrist, you, you shouldn't expect something else. You shouldn't expect exercise. You will get the pill. I just want to add something to that, Jersey, that in your dialogue, you, you're going more into the holistic approach, which isn't the norm. It's the abnormal. The normal is the quick fix, which isn't generally a fix. And I agree, you know, these pins, I have friends who've had foot surgeries done and all these pins and they come out, the screws come right through her skin a couple of years later and she has, and the doctor won't remove them. She has to go to another surgeon to have it removed and, you know, regretted the whole thing. But usually what happens if you, you go the medical route, you're offered what from their perspective is the best fix may not be, you know, there may be other options. There's usually other options, you know, and in your case, you were able to discuss it, Sherry, and that was really good. And in this dialogue, we're looking at the harder choices that she actually has to do something active to help herself. And most people just want the pill or the surgery. It's out of their hands. That's the norm in our culture. Somebody else is going to take care of this for me. I don't have to do anything, but I'm passive in the equation. You know, also, the, uh, when we go to, you know, doctors, their tools are very clear, right? Peel or knife. There is no other tools. They study for so many years to apply the, these two tools. And, of course, there is com complex uh, application here because, you know, there are surgeries that are very complex surgeries. You know, I... Uh, and the surgeries actually are needed. I had this client in LA that he was born with deformation of his foot and he was pain for 68 years and no surgeon would actually do the surgery, perform surgery on him. So at 68 and he, uh, he found me in LA and then, uh, uh, we tried to work with it, and then he found finally a surgeon that actually would perform a surgery uh, on his foot. And then, uh, then we were recovering that foot now for three years with micro progression and, and building that foot that would allow him to walk without a cane and, and without the pain. And actually it's happening now. Now he, after three years, he starts really walking and uh, that food is recovered through so many different uh, approaches that I did with him to recover that food. That's such good news. Yeah. But so, you know, you can see that, you know, surgery is a great thing, you know, and the medicine is a great thing, but it's not a great thing when uh, it doesn't, need to happen. Uh, just while you're talking about feet there, um, I actually have bunions. I was wondering, is that, like I was told that you'd have to have um, surgery for that, that, that there's nothing, no exercises or anything for it, but. Yeah, probably you need to shave it, yeah, because it's a okay. growth, like, a, like a bone spur. Yeah. yeah. Like a bone it's, spur. Sore. it's a growth of the bone, right? And. Uh, so you, you need to shave it. Yes, that's where uh, okay. the, the doctors can help a lot, right? So there are, you, you has to be something else developed in the future above the medicine, some kind of uh, um, craft, craftsman that would decide uh, to go to the doctors or do the surgery or not to go to uh, see psychiatrists or not or something else. We need some kind of, uh, or to see the psychologist, we need some kind of a craftsman uh, uh, on that level to decide whether we need a mechanic or not. And the surgeon is a kind of a mechanic, right? Do we need that mechanic? And if somebody has to make a decision, it doesn't look like we can make a decision or a doctor will, of course, will do whatever his tools are, right? So we are in the situation that 
Uh, we need help from somebody. So it, it should be developed some kind of uh, uh, um, a hub that happens between us uh, and and medicine. Actually, and I don't know I, where to go today, right? Where would you go? There's nobody to go, really. So uh, it should be a kind of a normal uh, um, profession develop that would actually help you know, between, between people and medicine. Actually, the woman I was talking about, Adela, actually had Bun Bunyan surgery. That's what she went through, and it was horrific. Not that it wouldn't happen to you. I, I approached um, a surgeon about my foot, and they are not doing surgeries like that anymore unless it's you know, unbelievably bad. So what they're recommending now is conservative measures. So you wear a brace on your foot at night, you get orthotics, you change your footwear, and you have to comply with all of these things over a long period of time before they'll look at doing any kind of surgery, which I believe is the right way to go. Um, but under certain circumstances, I think they will do it, but it's not, you can't even get to see in Canada, you can't get to see a foot surgeon unless it's so bad you can't walk, I would imagine. And mine has certainly improved dramatically with the conservative methods. I don't have any high fashion shoes anymore. <laughs> yeah, I know I've heard some horror stories and then some really good stories that say it's completely relieved the pain in the foot, but I'm kind of scared of it, to be honest. So do you have pain? Or? Uh, yeah, like when I, can't, I can't really bend my toe that way, you know, um, but not pain all the time. Just if I go for a, a long walk, I'd, I'd have pain or um, I, I was trying to do some jujitsu and it was just too painful because you have to move your feet so much and so much relies on your feet and constantly my, my bunions were really hurting me. Oh, I, I, I thought that the bunions that, you know, you see, that's why you uh, are concerned about that. That, you know, oh, no, I don't shape, mind that at all. Yeah, they, you know, the growth is on, on the side and right. So more, yeah, more very, yeah. it, it, very painful when you, you don't even look that big, you know. Okay. Yeah, mine, mine doesn't look that bad, but it it was very painful. But I can tell you now, I can hike. I've got the right footwear. I can hike, you know, 20 kilometers up and down hills, no problem. But without the right footwear, I can't. And I can do jerseys, lift the toes up, no problem. But there okay. are certain positions I can't do where the, the toes are, like, you know, in yoga, they want to stretch the bottom of the foot. Yeah, yeah, and that's where I find it hard, yeah. I try to do that. But so I, I, I think that uh, that I can give you the advice here because I didn't know uh, your story really. But uh, now I know your story. So first of all, don't go on long hikes. <laughs> and, and because you are wearing this out and you have to build that. It's like the story here in this dialogue. You need to build strength. Mm -hmm. In, in your feet and control, and then, then you can go on hikes. But first mm -hmm. you have to uh, build the capability, strength, and then when you go on a hike, you will have recovery system that is in your foot, and then you will not have any pains because of it. But you have to build that first. So the happy body is perfect for you. But you know, that building micro progression now you, you can easily do because the only thing that already uh, uh, could uh, hurt you is going on toes, right? Mm -hmm. So then you have all the sixes and you have, uh, you know, going on toes. So now you, you can develop, let's say, how many times you go on toes that is good and, and rebuilds you. So yeah, it I have, doesn't hurt, right? So is it one or is it three or is it four times and it's okay? So you that's what you have to build the micro progression. You have to find out, you have to stop doing everything else, first of all. Because that's that you have to have only one thing that you are dealing with, and one thing that you are dealing with has to have the power to make you stronger. 
So mm. that, that lift on toes can. So now, uh, now when you, and you can uh, easily control the micro progression here. So now you can decide, let's say, uh, how many times, you know, it's not six, but you will do three or two or four. So you need to say how many times you go on your toes and actually feels better next day over the certain days, right? Or it doesn't get worse. That's, that's where you need to start. If it doesn't get worse and you add the weight and, you know, weight to the strength, you know, going up, that it will override the problem. Okay, yeah, it's 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 no issue at all so far. Like doing four rounds of it, it's it's perfect. Yeah, but you do six repetitions, and when you go on toes. Yeah, yeah, six. Yeah. No, pro yeah, no problem. So, so no problem. So then, then slowly you need to start, um, you know, building the the strength and getting the weights on, and then when you start doing, let's say, twenty pounds on thirty pounds in that exercise that it will override any possible problems. Okay. And then the, the body also can grind the, the bones and can eat them. So it's not like a, uh, something that cannot happen. Because once the, the movement can take over, the strength, strength can take over, also that also the, sets up a different, uh, different relationship between bones and ligaments and tendons because everything grows too mm. right you know when you make stronger the the food a lot of ligaments and tendons will you know get stronger too it's not like only the muscle gets stronger yeah so that, okay that when you want the balance like let's say you sprain the ankle all the time the weightlifting uh, can correct that completely that you will never have it again but you have to have a certain uh, uh, level of weightlifting to achieve. Mm -hmm. So here is uh, is your happy body, and go for short walks, but try not to go on hikes. And when you go on hikes, make stops, like uh, at least like fifteen minute stops, and uh, go for. So you don't create the wear and tear in your in your body because you're wearing that, wearing it out, and it doesn't recover itself. So you bring the stress on the food, that recovery is too short to recover. And then the pain settles, the inflammation settles, so, so the food <laughs> doesn't, doesn't remove the waste materials fast enough, inflammatory system is set, and then you have the pain. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. I'll go in more cycles. Yeah, and then it's related to your strength uh, level that you have today and the situation in your food. So by increasing the strength, you also improve that, that problems in the food. And that will give you more distance without the problem to walk. Do you understand that? Yeah, yeah. It's complex, but uh, you, you, you can really get it that way. The worst thing is to do prematurely something that would, um, would bring inflammation to your food. So you have to avoid completely inflammation and getting stronger. Avoid getting stronger. What no. is it? Avoid. Avoid inflammation by getting stronger. So when you yes. in, avoid inflammation and you will keep getting stronger, it will override every problem that you could have in that food. Because if if you build the micro progression the right way, then you will get stronger. And once you get stronger, the body overrides problems in the food. And when you have yeah. a lot of strength then that, that food can do a lot. Okay, yeah, yeah, I understand now. Yes? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Very, yeah, you're welcome. Microperism is really hard to understand, but once you, uh, once you execute that microperism when it comes to pains and recovery, you know, uh, joints from pains or recovery 
the certain parts of the body that muscle or whatever the ligaments are, if they are not really broken and they are just a little bit, they have tears, you can restore that. If they are broken, of course, you have to take the knife and go in and, and sew everything like, uh, um, uh, like hamstring, let's say, right? when it's broken, it rolls on the, and then it has to be physically uh, attached back. But if you have the situations where strength can override the problems and build, you know, the, the, uh, the, the ligaments or tendons or the, the muscle, or even develop more space between the bones, then you can, uh, through the, the building the strength, you can achieve that. But the micro progression here is the issue because mm -hmm. it takes time and it takes time and a lot of care, a lot of patience uh, and a lot of uh, um, uh, knowing how much time and, and discovering yourself, self-coaching here or working with a coach like uh, like I am, for example, yeah? Somebody has to really give you the numbers, give you the training and you execute the numbers and then slowly the data comes in and, and slowly we learn uh, when is the pain and why it happened and if we change it, does it go away and how much of it, it is there. So all of it has to be comprehended and, 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 and approach in a way that we can learn from it, control it, and get stronger because the strength is the thing here. So if yeah. you have the pain, let's say with five pounds and you're going five pounds uh, and you have the pain, the, the really correct the problem here and build you would be to take 25 or 50 pounds in each hand, do the, the lift without any pain. And that, then you have, the you know your feet right yeah but you know to arrive there you need this a lot of micro progression in order to get there because what works against you is that inflammation works against you on the very low level so you do very little like the grocery in the actually your situation is kind of the same like the grocery and the woman that barely you know, uh, carries the grocery, and the grocery can cause the snapping of the uh, on or her tendencies and, and and break them. Right. So, in if she is in that situation, that to recover the body from that situation and to make stronger is masterpiece. Yes, it, it can be done, but it's a masterpiece because it's really a takes first of all time and takes uh, micro progression to make it happen. If you have time, then you get there. And, and that's why you need somebody that helps you with time and the right execution plan. Okay, I'll, I'll start my masterpiece footwork. That's good, good for you. <laughs> Thank you. Would you tell us in two years how it was? Yeah. Really interesting. amazing to hear right. this because I had no idea why my foot was better but obviously you know before I did the happy body program I could barely walk you know and now I'm walking as I said 20 kilometers no problem with the right footwear but still I can walk barefoot if I need to whereas before I mean I could not walk it was so painful and I had never attributed this to the happy body. It was like a mystery. Why is it healing? <laughs> and now, here we go. Now you, yeah, you are. <laughs> Mr. Soul. <laughs> you know, the body doesn't get better on its own. <laughs> no, when it's down and it has problems, you really have to work with it to mm. help it. Because, you know, it will only get worse, right? Yeah. Unless, you know, it's a kind of a, a bruises only that the body can heal without the help from the outside. But the help from the outside can happen 
because of the, uh, the this building the strength or bu building flexibility and strength because flexibility is built up too. Because you know you barely let's say raise yourself on toes and and you have lots of pain and you work on that level and you keep working only on that level when you just touch the pain and the body doesn't get worse right and then after about two three four months you you actually see that you don't have so much pain sometimes you don't have pain uh on tuesday sometimes on thursday right you have some days that you don't have pain you start lifting more weights and then uh the next situation is that after a year let's say you have couple of days that you don't have pain and then you know times comes that you don't have pain for a week and that's when the joints becomes very strong and then mm. it overrides everything else and then you forget about that you have pain and that 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 means that you are completely healed but when you are healed you're a lot of better than you were before so so you know, if you want to heal yourself for building strength, you cannot go to a doctor. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, if, if you go to a doctor, then, you know, you will get uh, a knife and a pill. And, uh, or, you know, all kind of foods and, you know, uh, adjustments that, you know, you, you make bra braces and things. Uh, and a lot of money behind that. Yeah, yeah. Right? A lot of it, it doesn't work? No, I don't think so. No, all of it is just like not working. All of it is just created just to make money, that's it. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, what weightlifters do simply, if they have straps and wraps and everything on the body, they have it to prevent yourself from crash. But when they crash, they take the belts off, straps and everything, and starts work, working with the bare body. So no braces, but working with that. Because once you put the brace, it's not different than you don't deal with it. And you just take the brace, like you would take cane, and you would not really uh, work with yourself not to have cane. Right? There's yeah. no reason that somebody would use cane. Everybody can drop the cane, yeah? But it becomes comfortable, somebody suggests, and people take the cane. Of course, you know, not to have the cane, you would need to uh, do certain things, you know, to get better, stronger, right? You to follow certain plan. And then, you get better and there is no need for cane. Why then, you know, braces would help you. They take away, they help you with the, you know, the right uh, balance, but they also rob you out of balance because they support you. Whatever supports you should be removed. Independence. Again, right? Dependency, not good. That's a really sick way of living. So the way of life is to find how to be independent and promote that way of life. Depends, dependency is horrible way of living. Right? Anybody wants to add something about dependency? I don't want I you to go down a rabbit hole, but I'm, I'm wondering about how you work with people who have degenerative conditions like arthritis or multiple sclerosis or something that is a medical condition that is not supposed to get better and is just supposed to continue to get worse. And if you don't want to do that today, that's fine. It just popped into my head as you were talking. Well, the same thing, if you have a mess, you know, you, you can improve 
Well, what happens with MS that certain nervous system is is gone, right? The certain part in the brain that you know activates the the muscle is gone, but only is gone certain level, right? It doesn't mean that you heal that, but you can uh, postpone in a way a lot. Because let's say you you have the muscle that is can lift hundred pounds, right? But you need only uh, hundred pounds of power, right, in the in the muscle. But you need to walk with only twenty percent of that. You need only twenty percent to walk. So what happened with MS is that the activation of that muscle is is uh, causing that the muscle is not used. The brain only activates seventy percent through thirty percent of the muscle. Now, whatever the the muscle you have, but the quality of the muscle is important. So you can work on the quality of the muscle, that muscle, what is left. What is, you, what is that available that you have? Well, you know, when it comes to uh, arthritis and yeah, like juvenile arthritis, you know, I, I had this person that came to me and she was uh, putting her hands in the refrigerator because it was so much in pain. And she was about maybe 30s, 40s. And the whole family suffered because it was cold all the time in the house. Because she would need to hold the uh, you know, hands in the refrigerator. And it was like that for a long time. So she came and I put her on a you know very simple diet. The pain was gone after a week. Gone completely. Gone. Just because and of diet? Just the diet, the, the exercise, I just put her on the happy body program and then gone. And husband was saying, you cannot imagine how is it in our family now. It's just like we have a normal family now. It was so, uh, and who knows, right? Because we really don't know. Uh, I don't know what worked. <laughs> I just don't know what worked, right? But it looks like anything that caused inflammatory system in in her body was gone. Mostly, I put her on the veggies, and veggies that are anti-inflammatory, alkaline, and created completely different uh, thing in her body. No pains, no infl no inflammation. Did you put her on a vegetarian diet? Mostly vegetables, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, drinking juices and and a little bit, you know, the grains and beans that mostly the the juices, veggies and and who knows whether it's in combination with the exercise, but that was gone. And would it happen with the other person? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Right? Good point. Yeah. But definitely you know, uh, veggies are uh, anti-inflammatory, very powerful. So people that have, you know, any kind of inflammatory system problem should be on veggies, right? That's kind of a logic. But for that, we need another dialogue to add, right? Maybe, maybe we have something like this in the Mastering for Choices. <laughs> we'll get up there. <laughs> All right, guys. Anyone would like to? Uh, oh, thank you for really letting me know about this 31st. I had to correct that. Jersey, I just wanted to add about you know what you were just saying about this person, and and definitely if we can think of our bodies in a holistic way, and we taking in a lot of toxic foods, overeating is toxic to the body. It's got to deal with all of that. It can't help you heal if you're eating bad food and too much of it. So your body is at a disadvantage. And with the exercise, it just helps your body deal with everything. I've just, you know, sort of reenacted my happy body diet. And I have to say, it's really challenging. I'm not complaining, but I was eating way too much 
you know, now that I've gone back and I had everything written down, I've readjusted everything. I went on to chronometer. I re looked at it. I thought, oh my God, I've just doubled everything. So now I'm back. I feel so much better. I feel lighter. It's still a challenge because of course I want to eat more, but you know, it really does allow your system a chance to rest at times. And also the, like the vegetables are so much easier to digest. You know, it's lighter and it's, your system can do other things. Right, why, why, why do you eat more than you need, right? First of all, why do you eat more than you need? Is it like, right, what is it like? Pleasure oriented or something that uh, you have to eat more than you need, right? And the, the second the second thing, why to eat something that brings inflammation? But this is really still uh, something that is new uh, for people to comprehend. So uh, we'll need more uh, articles about inflammation. So inflammation becomes something that is normal, right? Because now it's abnormal, right? So the normal today is that we eat food that are inflammatory. So then uh, bringing awareness to people that they should really think about when they eat food about inflammation is a big thing because a lot of uh, illnesses are based on inflammation, heating up the body. And also then you have endurance system that is also inflammatory uh, way of uh, you know, uh, creating inflammation in the body. So by exercise, we create inflammation. But the less we exercise, the less inflammation. That's why strength training system like the happy body works very well, because it is it's causing very little inflammation. And building the strength, so that's how it goes with uh, with this, you know, impossibility of walking too far because of the inflammation and the weakness, both, right? So now, when you really create such a uh, such a situation uh, in the body that is getting stronger, and also you eat more food that that is anti-inflammatory, then you're really helping yourself. You know that uh, the lifestyle solutions are very cheap, and they are available for everyone. So nobody can profit from it. Then nobody is interested to to do anything with it. Um, in your Aubrey Marcus podcast, um, I thought it was really interesting when you, you said, uh, learn to love to eat less. And I had never heard anyone say, like, you know, express it like that. It's always like you have this association with kind of like depriving yourself of the food or try to control yourself, but actually learning to, to love to eat less. I had never. That's the master, right? Yeah. yeah That's yeah. the master way. Uh, we talk about the master, uh, I think. Uh, yesterday about this goodness and the direction of the master that the master has a direction the goodness is not interested really about you know why we are not as good as as we're supposed to be right that's not master at all right master is not going to write books you know uh, how to how we get far the master will write the book how we get lean because lean is goodness or how we get strong, right? The master will not write the book how we become weak. So the master is interested, you know, to eating less, like and loving that that enough. What is the what is it enough? And falling in love with that, right? That is the direction. And then you start, you know, shifting this brain that from one sixty to one twenty, right? And then you start living this life of uh, of supporting uh, your extremely healthy way of living when you are 120. And that is your love. That's your kindness to do to your body too.
Yeah. What else did you capture there? Sorry, what else? What else did you did you get that from that podcast? From the oh my goodness, the whole thing was um, another. Well, another thing you said on that podcast, you said that um, you need to that your thing is like you talk a lot to people, you have lots of conversations, and that not everybody is going to pick up on the same thing. Not everybody's going to get that point. And that if you express things in several different ways, eventually the person will find one thing you said, and that will mean something to, to them. And that podcast really meant a lot to me. And it, it definitely shifted something for me that I was, I wanted to change and, um, and have the happy body, you know? And I had always been, just constantly eating, you know, like every time I pass the fridge, I'd have a little look in here or, you know, and it, it just, especially that point you, you said about learning to love less, I thought was very good. And I do think uh, the thing about um, the constant conversations is very important. And I, that's what I love about um, this whole series that you're doing. It's the constant exposure to it every day, every day coming in and sitting down at eight o'clock and then, you have something to think about, even if it's just one little thing. And it's, it's brilliant. I, I'm finding that it's changing my mindset. And um, that's, that's kind of what I, I, got, I got out of the, the Aubrey Marcus podcast in particular. Yeah. Sometimes we have to spend hours and hours to get one thing, right? There's yeah. No, there's no way. That's why uh, these sessions can work. Mm -hmm. Right, because you know, uh, but you, you only what is required, right? That you are participating, and if you're participating, then you uh, once a week you will get the message somewhere, right? And yeah, that, it will happen to you. But it's really something about uh, simplicity of life and, and living uh, simple. How the master chooses the the snacks in the happy body, right? And you know. Um, and usually there is a really funny thing that people uh, ask me, uh, what about this and this and that and that, right? I said, well, focus what is there. Don't focus what is not there. Yeah, yeah, you said that yesterday, yeah. Well, focus what is there, <laughs> right? <laughs> and not what's not there, because once you focus on what's not there, there will be thousands of things. Yeah, right. but another, another thing I notice is, uh, you know the way like sometimes you actually you think you have a uh, you think you understand something or you think you've changed only to find a couple of weeks later you actually haven't at all so that's why um, I'm really uh, conscious of that this time around and like the, I think the depth that we're going into everything here uh, is uh, very beneficial and I had never considered um, things such as virtues before it's not it's not even something in our language that we use you know it's um, it's a very different kind of a, an approach right you know I had this podcaster that um, that uh, this one let me see the virtues book right uh, so she bought it and she said, I would like to, uh, to have a podcast with you. And I said, well, the book is about practice virtues. And one virtue, you need to practice for one week. And there are 52 virtues. So you have to go through the book. It will take a year. And after a year, you can call me and we'll have the podcast. No, not now, <laughs> it's like, you know, oh, what I will be talking to you about, right? If you, if you don't go through it, you will not be able to ask questions. Yeah, and, and actually Benjamin Franklin did a similar thing as an experiment for himself. He, he, made, he had a list of virtues and he tried to adhere to one virtue per week. And every time he broke it, he put a little black dot on it and he focused on a different virtue and he kept doing it over and over again and he noticed that the the black dots became ah. less 
over the week. So it's a similar idea. Uh, send me the story. Um, it's or oh, something it's, about it. What is it? Yeah, I um, it's I read about it in a, a book called the uh, Happiness Hypothesis, and there's a lot of interest and stuff. Uh, while I'm waiting for your book on virtues, I was reading a little bit about virtues, and I thought that was quite interesting. And um, there's also stuff in it about, say, um, in the 1960s, there was um, a values clarification movement where teachers uh, were encouraged very strongly not to talk to their classes about moral values or about virtues. Um, and I think that that has had a big influence on everybody because it was a, a movement away from even the word, um, like before the Industrial Revolution, they had the word character and people had values associated with character like like self restraint and then um after that then as we kind of after the 1960s and we became a america in particular a kind of a mass consumer society the word personality emerged and it became all about the self and um your um your kind of uh, you know uh what is it again uh your personal individual preferences and your personal fulfillment and it became more, like really focused on the self as opposed to other people and like you say like virtues like kindness and goodness um and i think we we may be at the moment a little bit lost in terms of that so i, I think it's very important that that we do focus back on like aristotle and and Plato and think about the virtues that they spoke about or the, the ones that Benjamin Frankl, Franklin wanted to instill in himself to have character. Yeah, interesting what you say about the character, character versus, uh, you know, uh, versus like something else. What did you say that they said? Um, yeah, the word uh, personality, personality came in. Or charisma, right? Like it, yeah. you know, we involve more in the charisma. Maybe it comes from entertainment and you know the being celebrity and yeah. trying to be celebrity, and then uh, it is more uh, coming through not building the character, but building outsmarting, you know, uh, uh, somebody else. So building the knowledge to outsmart, sounding like somebody else, that but not really be somebody else so something like socrates right but not be socrates right so it's a yeah. it's a kind of where we have this kind of that uh society or people that they are moving that direction i told you about this movie the lean on me uh, no debaters debaters was the movie that 1935 and it's so much character so much you know beautiful people interested in uh, in knowledge and, and in uh, character and, and integrity and, and building the you know themselves that way the teachers and and wow it was just like a, a revelation to watch this and comparing to uh, Lean on Me 1987 and then this high school like like you cannot even imagine that something like this could could happen in life completely. Uh, loss of uh, of the of the character loss of uh, of uh, what, what what goodness i don't know we 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 focus uh, on something like catching the happiness uh, and not really um, creating the happiness through our own virtues so i remember when dyer was saying the story about two cats i i probably told you but i will repeat i will say it again <laughs> so this as this old cat is walking and he sees this young cat running in circles and tries to catch the tail. And he says, hey, what are you doing? And the young cat said, well, I went to the university for cats and I learned that the happiness is in the tail. So now I'm trying to catch it. If I catch it, I will get, I will have it. And the old cat said, well, you know, I didn't go to any university, but I learned in life that if you take care of the things on daily basis, what you're supposed to, then the tail follows you wherever you go. Mm. So, yes, very good. 
So it is, uh, uh, the Stoics here is very clear about that, Stoicism, that the happiness is the result of virtues, is the side effect of virtues. So there's a side effect, effect of the character. It's the side effect. It's not really something that we should work on. And it cannot, it's because if we do, it's a shortcut. So we try to get the shortcut to happiness and get the happiness. And that cannot be done simply. So people uh, here try to capture the happiness and uh, some other things in life, right? That cannot be really captured because it's a, simply a shortcut of something that uh, it's, it's the result of whole being happiness. And it is not really that you can buy something or you can outsmart somebody or you can be charismatic and you, that's why you're happy because that would be crazy to believe in such a thing. Happiness is something that is available for everyone. And if it is available for everyone, that it has to be something that is not really connected to anywhere where we are, any language that we speak, any color that we have, any money that we have, any, any wisdoms that we have, all of it is gone. Right. And people are able to be happy in so many different conditions. And they are. Yeah, actually, uh, do you know the book, uh, Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning? Right. Yeah, that's it really hits the nail on the head with that one. Yeah, we, we have today miserable uh, billionaires and we have happy billionaires. We have miserable poor people and happy poor people, right? We have miserable all colors people and we have happy people, right? We have short people that they are really happy and not happy. We have people in pain that they are happy and people in pain that are miserable. People are getting old and there are some of them, they are happy. Some of them, they are completely miserable. Happiness, happiness doesn't really depend on all the physical conditions that they are all around us. Is this is the side effect of a character or the virtues that what we are. And when it happens, when we come to the point that we are really happy the way that we are, that's where the happiness happens. You're proud of being who you are and you love yourself the way that where you are. And it happens then. That's where it is. And you cannot write a, a, a book and deliver in the book, maybe one fourth of the book and say happiness, uh, just be happy. Like, yeah, just do it, right? Okay, wow. Benjamin Franklin, right? The Franklin, that was the Franklin who was? Yeah, I, I, I will send you the, the story. Wow, yes. You know, when, when you, uh, the gracefulness, the calmness is attractive, is beautiful. And when we have, that was the, the woman in the, uh, in the movie, in the rush, right? The, the wife, it was a beautiful character. Uh, so, you know, it's like, uh, there are people when we see them, we see them right away that the character is beautiful. The character. And maybe it's time to start the building that thing within us, right? And not the outside that really matters much. You know, like uh, poets or, you know, professors, they are in universities and they go in, in teachers and high school, wherever they are, right? Teachers all over. Uh, and, you know, millions of people are never really uh, thinking that they work for money. Somehow money happens, right? You know, they work, they get the money, 
but they are really connected to what they do. The value is that they are teachers. The value is that, you know, they are plumbers, whatever they are, right? The value is in that what they do and how they do, what the Victor Frankl is saying is that how we do matters. How we do, that is how we put the meaning into our life. Our life is meaningful if how we do is graceful and kind and good. And our life is not meaningful if what we do is mean and uh, taking advantage of the weaker. Can I ask which book of Victor Frankl's he writes about this in? Oh, Men's Search for Meaning? Yeah, it's, not, it's that one. Okay. There's another book, uh, The Doctor and the Soul. That is Thank more you. expanded book about, you know, what Victor Frankl is um, talking about, uh, anxiety and fears and, and all this... Uh, Negative that they did. And the cultures of the culture, you know, uh, shapes us and society. And all right, guys, time to go. Awesome day today. You see, you. we we always warm up when the one hour passes. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, Thank you, guys. Thank you, Adela, for contributing so much today as well. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah, it was a good discussion. You never know yes. how it happens and who we are talking to. Yeah, sometimes, you know, yeah, 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 people talk between. Sometimes I, I am in the conversation, sometimes not. But that's how it's supposed to happen. That's the most meaningful thing is that when we all, you know, grow together. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. 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 See you tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.